Well, welcome back. I uh, hope you've had a good week. Uh, I know I have, uh, and mine's been filled with chocolate chip cookies with walnuts, and uh, the best thing I had was cinnamon roll cheesecake bars. <clears throat> so don't judge me. We all have our ways of coping with the virus. And I watched my uh, video last week. It was sort of cringeworthy. Uh, and I noticed that there were a couple of things that were happening, which I'm going to try to correct a little bit today. One is that uh, I am used to having a a group in front of me and I ask a lot of questions. As a teacher, you know, you want to keep people awake or you want to see what they know or get a feedback from them, so you ask them a question. And standing in front of a camera with nobody else in the room, uh, I didn't uh, do that and I wasn't able to do that. And uh, it made me feel like I was giving a sermon. And I don't want to sermonize, I want to teach. Um, although, you know, as I teach, I try to put application for our lives in it. So it has some aspects of a sermon, but I want to ask questions. So today I'm going to probably ask more questions because I found out that when I didn't ask a question, uh, I couldn't take a drink of coffee. Uh, I always bring my coffee to teach and I always ask a question. And a lot of times I'll ask a question just so I can take a sip of coffee and wet my throat, but I enjoy coffee. So I brought my coffee again today, and I'm going to ask questions, and I'm going to take a drink of coffee. I also uh, invited my wife today, uh, not because she is the greatest cook in the world, or beautiful, uh, but I'm wanting her to give me a little bit of feedback because, you know, she's usually in the classes with me, and, and so I look to her, and sometimes... She gives me signals uh, like uh, this. And that means, okay, teacher boy, you're getting behind. You need to speed up a little bit. Uh, another one she might do is, if I can do it, something like this. Uh, that means quit chasing the rabbits. Get back on track. So she's here today, and she'll give me a little feedback at the end of this. And... Uh, uh, so uh, hopefully this lesson will be a little bit different than last week. Uh, you know, I know uh, I tend to cope with the virus by looking at Pinterest and finding great desserts to eat. And I know some of you have probably used other methods of, of coping with it. But I, found, I realized... Uh, it's been over five weeks since I've been to Wally World, or as I affectionately call it, uh, you know, uh, that's what I affectionately call it as Wally World instead of Walmart. And I uh, were, realized that I was missing it. And most of you might say, get a life if you miss Walmart. Uh, you know, most people don't like going to Walmart. But every now and then I like to go to Walmart and walk the aisles, dodge the electric carts, and you know maybe see some people in the neighborhood and you talk to them. And it's been a while since I've been able to do that because we've been uh, just doing the pickup groceries uh, where you call and order online and do that sort of thing. And I was in the house the other day and wandering around and I, I found a Walmart bag. And I started looking at it, sort of nostalgically, and before long, I found myself in, in front of the pantry. And I opened the pantry door, and I started reaching in and shopping. I thought, oh, that's a can of chili. I need chili. Oh, soup. Uh, oh, there's some tomato paste. I even wandered over to the refrigerator and opened the drawer and there's some cheese. Need some cheese? Oh, there's some frozen stuff I need. And I filled up a bag. And I was looking at it, being proud of myself because I had found a way that I could pretend I was at Wally World. 
And I looked over at my wife and she was standing there sort of looking at me and I thought, hey, she can participate too. And I said, why don't you be the cashier and I'll hand you the stuff and you can slide it across the table and go beep, beep, like the little scanner does. And she looked at me very peculiarly and made the comment that we need greater social distancing. And she went upstairs for several hours. So each of us have to cope with some of the things that we miss and some of the things that, you know, we want to do. Uh, I use food and think about Wally World. Okay, back to Romans. We're in Romans 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14. Now, last week, we talked about when becoming a Christian, we become at peace with God. And we talked about what this peace was. It's a, you know, it's not a peace that the world gives you, you know, absence of conflict, absence of war or, or that sort of thing. It's a spiritual peace. And uh, then we got into uh, how affliction or suffering produces endurance, how endurance builds character and how character produces hope and how hope expresses itself in love. Great verses. I would encourage you, if you uh, haven't read those, to read them because peace is important. Perseverance is important. Building character is important as a Christian. Now this week, we're going to sort of skip ahead a little bit because Romans, the Romans that we're doing here is sort of a survey course. Uh, we take chunks of scripture uh, to be able to finish it within about 12 to 13 weeks. And uh, uh, so some of the things we skip, uh, the things we will include, uh, if we really wanted to do an in-depth stu uh, study of Romans, it'd probably take a year. Uh, so hopefully what you're getting here is uh, a real great feel for the book of Romans, and you can do some individual Bible study. Uh, so this week, Paul begins chapter 6 by posing a question about the implications of some of these things he said at the end of chapter 5. Uh, because in the last couple of verses of chapter 5, Paul uh, wrote that where sin increased, God's grace super increased. Uh, that is, as sin would increase, so would God's grace abound to cover the sin of all of those who trusted in Christ's death to cover their sin. Uh, we literally uh, cannot out sin the grace of God. Well, that brings up a question uh, that some people had is, is Paul saying, hey, we can just go out and sin and God's going to fix it for us. And he's going to cover us in grace. Uh, uh, do we get a, you know, is, is being a Christian like getting a get out of jail or getting out of hell free card? Uh, and Paul talks about this. And starting in chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, and he says, What should we say then? Talking about sinning. Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? He poses the question. And then he answers it, absolutely not. How can we who die to sin still live in it? So Paul gives this emphatic answer, no, absolutely not continue to sin. Because believers cannot continue to live in sin because we have died to sin. Now what does die to sin mean? That's a question, a drink of coffee. You know, I'm a Christian, I'm still alive, Sin is out there. What does this concept of died to sin mean? Because, you know, when you're dead, 
nothing affects you. You're separated from everything. And so we look at this and we say, well, does that mean that sin is no more, supposed to be no more in my life? Uh, is sin supposed to be something that's way over there? Uh, exactly what does this concept mean? And, and so I, I was trying to figure out a way to explain it. And the best way that I could come up with is that if you've ever seen some of the Godfather type movies uh, where one of the characters, uh, say usually the father or the one that's in charge with the family, he has a problem with either a son, daughter or uh, brother or someone in the family and, and this person has done something to grossly wrong him and he looks at them and he issues this phrase. The father says, you are dead to me. I can't say it like Marlon Brando, but anyway, it's a phrase like that. You are dead to me. Well, what does this mean? You know, neither one of them dies. What it means is that their relationship has changed. They're no longer part of the family. They're no longer invited uh, into the home. There's no conversations. If the father who, er, who uttered this happens to see them on the street, he says that, you know, I will cross over to the other side to keep from interacting with you. We are no longer friends. There are no conversations. There are no celebrations. You are disowned. You no longer mean the same to me as you did before. For me, that's what it means to die or be uh, dead or died to sin. Because as Christians, it means that we are in a different relationship with sin. It no longer has power over us or over our lives. We have a different view of sin. We don't have the relationship with sin that we had before. Before we were saved by faith in Christ, we lived in sin. And now we are dead to sin. In uh, Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul writes, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So Christ made us alive, even when we were living in sin or dead to our transgressions. Now we are alive in Christ and dead to sin. And Paul continues with a second question in verses three and four, where he says, are you unaware that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried by him, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. And he begins, he says, are you unaware? Telling the Romans or sort of reminding the Romans, remember when you were baptized, when you were baptized into Christ, that we were baptized into his death. You know, Really, Paul is getting very deep here uh, because sometimes we look at baptism as a symbol and in, the, in this church, we, we use it as a, an ordinance. We use it as, a, uh, as something that uh, 
sort of shows everyone that you have invited Jesus into your heart, that you've become a Christian, that Jesus is Lord of your life. Now that's already taken place when you declared this, but the baptism is a symbol that you are now following in Jesus' footsteps and that you are declaring to everyone that you are a Christian. Uh, you know, baptism doesn't save you. That was com already completed. Uh, and it, it is a sign to the church and to the world that the sacrificial work of Christ on the cross for us and that we are joined in union with Christ and his fate. Um, if you look in verse four, therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Uh, usually when we baptize a person, either the pastor or the individual who is baptizing the person makes this statement as they're uh, baptizing. Uh, and it says, since we have been buried with him by baptism into death, we are raised to walk in the newness of life. Probably a lot of you have heard those words over these years. What he's saying is we can live changed lives because he uses the phrase, uh, so we too may walk in the newness of life. Just as Jesus' resurrection was by the glory of the Father, our ability to live changed lives is empowered by the same glorious Father. So we don't need to treat baptism lightly. You know, it is, yes, it is a showing of the world that we are followers of Christ, but it is also a union, a joining of Christ. And uh, through this, we share the same glory that Christ did, the same glory of the Father, so that we may too walk in newness of life. Again, life and death to sin. In verses five through seven, Paul continues in saying, for if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body uh, ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is free from sin. Well, let me interrupt here and put your attention toward the board because there's a couple of things I put up here that I meant to tell you earlier. One is these are two websites that you can go to that uh, I use and they're easy to use and they're free and you can just go on them and uh, when you go on, you can type in uh, a search for Romans 6 a particular verse or all the verses, and they will come up, in, especially in Net Bible, it's very easy to use. It will come up and it will give you the Net Bible, which is a, a very good translation. But then if you look at single verses, it will give you King James, uh, uh, NASB, NIV, several of the others. The great thing that I like about it is that it also incorporates Strong's uh, dictionary of Hebrew and Greek, uh, and it has the numbers there, and you can just tap on the number there, and it'll, the definition of the word will come up. And it's, it's good because there are certain words that you look at and you tend to gloss over, but if you really look at the meaning of them, they have a lot of meaning. And uh, so you can follow me along and check me out by 
clicking on those words or following me in the various verses or look at various translations as you're studying these verses. And that's what we're doing here. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, he will certainly also, uh, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Um, so what does it mean in the likeness of his death and the likeness of his resurrection. Um, you know, when, when we were baptized, we did not die. Uh, we not, did not go to the cross um, and, and, it, and we didn't go to heaven either. Uh, what he's talking about likeness here is that we have this, we are modeling what Jesus did. We are uh, coming into or, or really telling people, or telling the world that we identify with Jesus and what he did for us and what will happen to us. Um, we did not accompany him to the cross physically or to heaven physically, but spiritually, we are in union with Christ in his death and his resurrection. Um, for if we were united with Christ in his death, then certainly we will be re resurrection, resurrected as he was also. And if you look in verse 6 and 7, it says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. Uh, he expresses the same thought in Galatians 2.20 where he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, it expresses that same idea that he's saying in verse six and seven here. Uh, it's that our old self is gone or has been replaced or we're in union with Christ. When we trusted Christ in our Savior, we were united to Him. The word literally means grown together, that we have been grafted into Christ. Uh, we have not yet physically died as Christ did, but we are joined to him in the spiritual benefits of his death. Our union or growing together with Christ is very close as the word united implies, but it is not exact. Uh, We are united with him in the likeness of his death. And we will certainly in the likeness of his resurrection. Um, so the power of sin to control us or have power over us has been broken by our virtue of our union with Christ. We are no longer slaves to sin. Uh, since a person, in verse 7, it says, since a person who has died is free from sin. Uh, what he is saying here is that he who has died has been justified or acquitted 
from sin. Sin has no jurisdiction over us. Now, when you were a slave to sin, it had jurisdiction over you. It controlled you. But as a Christian, sin has not, does not have that jurisdiction uh, over us. Okay, now you might be saying, uh, I sort of understand some of this. I realize I'm a new creature, but you know, sometimes my old nature causes me to sin. Uh, maybe I still battle some old temptations and I, sometimes I feel my sinful nature reasserting itself. Uh, I look at it this way. Now, if you look in Ephesians 4, chapter 4, 22 to 24, I can find it here. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful uh, desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Look at it this way. There, there is uh, what we would call a, uh, an already but not yet tension in the Christian life. The old person has been crucified with Christ and the new person is a reality. But that old me must still be resisted and its desires opposed. Uh, the old me living in sin uh, and its power over me was broken when I became a Christian. And now I have the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit to resist that old nature. Remember, we are in union now with Christ. We have the Holy Spirit within our lives. We are a new creation. He didn't say you are a new sinless creation. Creation, He said, you are a new creation. You are newborn. <laughs> and just as Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And through me, you will get what you need to produce fruit. That's that being grafted on, that union with Christ. It doesn't mean that everything becomes a standstill, uh, you know, that we are somehow uh, creatures with a new uh, brain or something like that to where, you know, any type of sin is deflected from us. No, we're still human. We're still in this world. We have not died physically and we have not ascended to heaven to be with Christ yet. We are still here and we are being fed by the Holy Spirit. We are learning what it is for our faith. Our faith grows. We call it the Christian walk. And we don't become static. We are growing. Because if a branch is grafted onto the trunk of a tree and all those nutrients flow through it, what does it do? Well, it grows. It produces fruit, which is what Jesus wants us to do. We, it's almost like that we have a new DNA with inside of us. We have been changed. If you watch a lot of science fiction, you might say uh, we're aliens <laughs> because in a, a way, yes, we are. Uh, and in first uh, Peter, 
Uh, let's see, First Peter, uh, I didn't put it up there, but if you look in First Peter, I think it's chapter 2. Uh, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. I like the King James Version because in the King James Version it says, You are a peculiar people. <laughs> now when King James was written, Peculiar did not have the bad connotation that it has now. Uh, when you say, oh, he's sort of peculiar, it means he's sort of odd in a negative way. Peculiar just meant different. We should be different as Christians. Uh, we should, in our attitudes and our actions and uh, our countenance, be a little bit different. People should recognize this difference. It's interesting, if you go back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, God says the same thing about the Jewish people. He wanted them to be a peculiar people. They were His chosen people. And He wanted to be their God and that all nations would be blessed through them. Well, what happened? Well, it didn't happen. They got so tied up into the law and obeying the laws and all the other little laws um, that they invented to go along with it, that they lost track of what they were supposed to do. Through Jesus, we as Christians are now supposed to be the peculiar people, to see what God has done with us, to be able to, uh, as he said um, in verse 9, Oh, I lost it. Uh, to be the chosen people and to spread the gospel and to be a holy nation belonging to God and that we might declare the praises of him who called us out of the sin, out of the darkness, into the light. So, I am a new creature but not a sinless one yet. And I won't be until I'm resurrected. But with my new nature, I am not ruled by the old. I am not enslaved to sin because through the living power of the Holy Spirit, I can say, sin is dead to me. I have a different relationship. It's not me that's fighting against the old nature. It is the new creature, which is me plus the Holy Spirit. So Paul is trying to bring all this together and showing through these questions and through going through some of these questions, asking these questions of the Romans, which we can ask ourselves today, is that you need to understand how you and Christ have been brought together. What this union is, what this union means. It means that you're not alone. It means that you're not out there battling uh, some addiction or sin or whatever by yourself. You are a new creature. You, new creature, you are dead to sin. You have a different relationship. And so he's moving into this. If we look in verses uh, 8 and 9, it says, Now if we died with Christ, we will also, uh, we, we believe that we will also live with him, because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules. Jesus' death on the cross broke the power of death. His death and His resurrection anticipate the final resurrection of us as believers and God's ultimate victory over death. Again, He is saying, wow, look at all you have as a new creature in Christ. 
Now I'm going to stop here. I think I've run out of time. Uh, I haven't been keeping track of it, but there's several other verses in here uh, that talking about sin reigning over us and our relationship with sin and telling us not to use uh, sin as a weapon, but offer all ourselves to God and use, our, uh, use ourselves as righteousness and to, uh, again, bring uh, praises to God, to grow his church, and to be the person that God wants you to be. Uh, because, as it says in the last verse, for sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace is not for us to just go out and sin whenever we want to and then ask God for forgiveness. No, it is that one thing that we have where we can come to God and repent and say, forgive us when that old nature rises up within us and we don't use the power within us through the Holy Spirit of being able to resist it. That is God's grace. Okay, I'll see you next week and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, let me pray us out of here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Uh, that Sometimes your word is so simple that we understand it right out. But as we get into it, we see that there is a tremendous depth to it. Uh, and I just pray that this week that the people listening to this and reading these words will really understand what it is as far as being baptized and their union with Christ and being dead to sin. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.